Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Impact Forum. I'm Dr. Abigail Wozniak, and I'm a labor economist and the vice president and director of the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute. We're a research initiative at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, and we conduct and promote research to both increase economic opportunity and identify it better, and also to promote inclusive growth for all in our economy. Before I get rolling, I need to remind you that what I'm gonna share with you today is my views and doesn't necessarily reflect that of the Federal Reserve System or the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. With that, I'm really excited to kick off today's Impact Forum. This is the Constellation Fund's annual deep dive into the details behind their evidence-driven approach to fighting poverty. The focus of this year's conversation is a new initiative at Constellation, CoLab. CoLab is going to be a source for new actionable evidence on what works in fighting poverty. As Constellation's research arm, CoLab will catalyze, fund, and support in-depth studies of poverty-fighting solutions both in the Twin Cities and beyond. Over the next hour, we're going to dive into the details of how CoLab is going to conduct its studies. We're going to learn more about how an early focus on lived experience and expertise will inform and enhance CoLab's research agenda. And we're going to explore an example of how targeted and community-informed research can lead to systems and policy change. Before we go all the way down that road, I want to back up for a minute and set the stage a bit by explaining a bit more about what it is that the Constellation Fund does to help you understand how this innovative new initiative and collab will fit into that. I've been privileged to have a front row seat to Constellation Fund's work since the earliest stages. In late 2019, a few months after Constellation officially launched, I joined the Fund's Impact Council. This is a group of researchers who support and advise Constellation's talented team on continuously developing, developing and improving their evidence-driven metrics. Constellation staff take the best available evidence on similar programs and apply that evidence consistently across providers who are seeking Constellation's funding. The metrics take this evidence on similar programs and they quantify benefits on a variety of outcomes. For example, improved health, increased income, perhaps other benefits. Constellation has built over 230 such metrics to help them do their work. And the Impact Council is tasked with advising Constellation on continuously developing and refining more and better metrics. But as so many of us know, an algorithm is really only as good as the information that you can feed it. And despite a real abundance of relevant information on related programs, we often wish in developing Constellation's metrics that there was more that we could say or that there was a specific question that we had answered. That is really where CoLab comes in. CoLab, as a research enterprise, is going to be a natural complement to Constellation's core grant-making work. By taking the role of building some of that evidence, CoLab really fits together with Constellation's underlying project. You can think of it this way. Where Constellation is bringing to philanthropy a powerful approach to leveraging the best available evidence, CoLab is going to be part of creating the best available evidence. And in a real benefit for us here in the Twin Cities, some of this research is going to be grounded and collaborative with Twin Cities providers. That foundation is going to even better link CoLab's evidence to Constellation's work of funding providers here in the Twin Cities. Ultimately, CoLab's evidence will inform Constellation's work, but it will also do much more. CoLab evidence will be shared widely, so it can be leveraged by peer funders and community organizations elsewhere to further their own efforts. It can also be leveraged by our elected officials and policymakers to reshape systems and deepen the impact of public investments. Why do I think this impact, this evidence is going to be so impactful? So it turns out if you know where to look, 
there actually is a lot of evidence out there on how to fight poverty and expand economic opportunity. I just told you we developed 230 metrics and we relied on a lot of evidence to do that. But increasingly, a valid study by one or two or three researchers working largely independently of the individuals they're studying, that kind of evidence alone is not enough. It actually really matters how these studies were designed. It matters who got to shape the main questions. It matters how um, individual partners and participants were consulted, were they appropriately included, were their views represented. And it also matters how all of this was communicated. Evidence making is often thought of as the domain of those lonely academics, maybe one, two, or three of them, working off in a kind of dark office or basement somewhere on a single study. But more and more, building credible evidence is really a communal activity involving a larger number of researchers and collaborating more directly with service providers. I'm confident that CoLab will bring this collaborative approach to its evidence building. And that is why, in the end, I think it will be a very successful strategy for identifying um, and moving ahead with poverty fighting strategies, particularly here in the Twin Cities. I want to say a little bit more about the potential that we can unlock here. I'm often asked to provide a single story that provides an example that says, here is how research can be taken into the world and used to encourage this type of effective policy rollout and expansion. I don't often have a single study to point to in that kind of story. I know folks have in mind a great invention, a eureka moment, a great study that says, aha, this is exactly how we can make a really big dent in poverty. But more and more, it's important to have that collage of evidence, and it's important to have that collaborative approach that ultimately builds a consensus around what that evidence means and how to use it. And that type of situation makes it harder to point to this study con convince these folks to do all of these different things, or that study had that impact over there. It really is an ongoing effort. And I think the clearest way to see that is that when I started my career, it was pretty rare to have evidence building built into the design of new programs. And it was rare to have policymakers require that kind of evidence building for ongoing funding or as a condition of enacting a new program. It was left to researchers to try to figure it out independently and then hope they could get their findings out effectively. Now, that type of expectation is typically built in, either by funders or by policymakers. There's a greater demand for evidence, and it's routine that we expect folks that are deploying these types of programs to be able to work on that evidence and bring more of it to light. That's where the collaborative approach becomes a great strength and really a necessity to have impact. And CoLab's approach has real potential to do that. I'm excited to explore the potential for this impact today. And I want to underscore how excited I am that CoLab has brought on Dr. Matthew Morton as its inaugural director. I think Matt is positioned exactly right to help realize this full potential, and I'm thrilled that you'll hear more from him today. Matt, the floor is yours. Thank you, Abby. We're so grateful for your partnership, and thanks for kicking us off today. Hi, everyone. We're so glad that you're here and that you've taken the time to join us today. I'm Matt Morton, CoLab's Executive Director. Look, I'm a researcher by training, I'm a nerd. I like long walks on the beach and evenings of designing unbiased sampling strategies. But I started this work with a very personal perspective. I grew up in Florida where I had experienced a lot of loss, adverse experiences and household trauma growing up, but I got it lucky. At age 15, I had a high school English teacher who saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. She became my advocate in and outside of the school. She also helped, happened to be one of the adults supporting a group of young people in my county who were on the verge of starting Florida's first youth-driven teen center. So for months, my teacher tried to get me to go to this youth council meeting. I finally went to get her off my back, and it changed my life. I was amazed by this powerful group of diverse teens and supportive adults. Many had also gone through serious trauma at a young age, and they were transforming their pain into a passion for something bigger than themselves. In our program, young people were literally in charge of everything from 
painting the walls to hiring and firing adult staff. Based on this experience, I was invited to give the keynote address at the White House's first National Youth Summit when I was 17, and that launched me almost overnight into national youth advocacy. But I realized quickly that I was lucky, and many young people aren't so lucky. My little sister wasn't so lucky. She experienced homelessness well into her young adulthood. Many other young people in our programs and in my community also weren't so lucky, especially youth of color who had so many more odds against them. This is how I got into research and evaluation as powerful tools for change. You see, research could help make the invisible visible, such as young people's experiences of homelessness and housing instability, as well as their strengths. I also learned that evaluation could help us look honestly at the outcomes of our programs and people's experiences, including when those experiences were different with the same programs. The evidence from high quality evaluation could also help us take good solutions to scale so that we could change systems and we could achieve population level impact on the issues that we cared about. This way, we don't have such a thing as lucky and unlucky young people. That's why I am so excited to be working at CoLab. CoLab has the incredible potential to fund and catalyze exactly this kind of critical research. I spent my first few months on the job starting up CoLab doing a lot of listening. I had conversations with over 110 people representing philanthropy, government, community nonprofits, research, and lived expertise. A few top level themes emerged from our first months of listening. First, many people highlighted the importance of long-term research investments and data collection. You see, most studies only have funding to understand the short-term effects of programs and policies. With CoLab, we have the groundbreaking potential to also reveal how programs and policies shape people's pathways through and out of poverty and onto long-term thriving by following their outcomes and their experiences for many years. Second, we know that people living in poverty have complex needs and we need multi-component solutions to true long-term impact. So folks encourage CoLab to study those kinds of multifaceted solutions designed for meaningful change in people's lives. Third, people underscored that we have to stop focusing so much on symptoms. By funding evaluations of upstream prevention solutions and those that tackle the drivers of deep-seated racial dis disparities, we can support bigger and more cost-effective change. And finally, almost universally, stakeholders advise CoLab to build an actionable research agenda by collaborating with communities and lived experts in the process of developing and implementing a bold new research agenda. Building on the themes that we've heard, to better explain CoLab's purpose and our approach to research investment, I'm very excited to share with you a brand new short video. We'll make this video available publicly after this forum, and we hope that you'll find it useful and that you'll share it around. Thank you. CoLab's purpose at the Constellation Fund is to invest in actionable research on poverty-fighting solutions. At CoLab, we hold population-level impact as our North Star. We believe strategic investments in research can help drive that level of impact by informing funding and policy. Even with programs and policies that have great anecdotes, we often have blind spots. Without good data, we can't really know the results for everyone who participates and whether some people benefit more than others. Often, programs exist and grow more because of their fundraising capacity than their demonstrated impact. This is where CoLab comes in. CoLab invests in world-class research and programs impacts so that funders and people living in poverty can make better informed choices based on evidence of meaningful change in people's lives. One key type of research we support is called longitudinal impact evaluation. Wait, can you unpack that? Yeah, for sure. Let's start with impact evaluation. An impact evaluation assesses the effect that a program or policy has on specific outcomes. It challenges us to be clear about meaningful changes we hope to see in people's lives and examine whether a program or policy causes those changes. But how do we know that those changes are caused by a program and not by something else, such as someone simply getting older, or changing economy? 
or supports coming from other sources. If people's outcomes don't improve during or after the program, how do we know that the program didn't prevent outcomes from getting worse? So imagine I told you that 100 first-generation college students were selected to receive financial support and personalized coaching through a new program to support college completion. Then I told you that 60% of those students completed college, while the national average for first-generation college students to get their degree is only 26%. Wow, looks like that program improved college completion by 34 percentage points. Not bad. But wait, what if I also told you that this program selected only the most motivated and high achieving students to begin with? And it turns out that close to 60% of those students would have graduated college with or without the program support. Well, now you might be thinking differently about the poverty fighting impact of this program. This gets to one of the trickiest parts of conducting a credible impact evaluation. To answer these how do we know questions, researchers have to establish something called a counterfactual. A counterfactual is what would have happened if someone did not participate in the program. Is that why researchers use secret time machines to evaluate programs? Unfortunately, researchers haven't invented a time machine yet. So the best we can do without a time machine is to create a comprising group of people who do not participate in the program that is very similar to the people who do participate. And then we follow and compare the outcomes of both groups over the same time period. So that way, the only difference between the two groups is participation in the program. And we know that any difference between the groups and changes to their outcomes reflects the true impact of the program. Exactly. Now, ideally, for estimating the impact of a program, researchers create a comparison group by randomly assigning eligible people to the program group and to one or more comparison groups. We call this a randomized trial or experimental design. Now imagine most programs do not have enough resources to serve all the people who could benefit anyways. So random assignment can provide a fair and transparent way to offer spaces or resources while allowing for a credible way to assess the program's impact. That's right. But still, sometimes a randomized trial isn't feasible. True. And in these cases, researchers can use other ways of creating a comparison group. These non-randomized approaches to creating comparison groups are called quasi-experimental designs. For example, researchers might statistically match people on different characteristics, such as income, education, race, or ethnicity. But this doesn't usually account for harder to measure differences between groups, like motivation. So given that limitation, we're typically less sure about how we can attribute changes and outcomes to the program when we use quasi-experimental designs rather than randomized trials. So what about the first part of this term, longitudinal? So let's think long or long term. Very few evaluations ever study the impact of programs on people's outcomes beyond even a year or two. For example, housing assistance might have short term effects on families, housing stability, and well being. Yet, that same stability could also help children stay in school, experience healthier development, and eventually attain higher levels of education and income as they transition into adulthood. Mm. When we commit to tracking long-term outcomes, we can show how those causal pathways unfold and we can demonstrate a greater return on investment. Mm. Unlike most research funding, Colab invests in research that follows people's outcomes using surveys and data through public systems over many years, in some cases more than a decade, while sharing lessons along the way. But there's more to the story than just numbers, right? Of course. Often we need to know why programs do or don't have the impact we expect, or how we can make them as effective as possible. Process evaluation plays an important role alongside impact evaluation in answering these how and why questions. A process evaluation uses qualitative research and mixed methods to shed light on program implementation, how people experience the program, context, unintended consequences, and mechanisms for change. For example, imagine an impact evaluation of a cash assistance program, providing $1,000 monthly with financial coaching to young adults who've been in foster care that aims to improve their long-term economic empowerment. Perhaps an impact evaluation shows a reduced employment rate after two years of participation for young people in the program. Oof, that seems a bit concerning. But now imagine that through in-depth qualitative interviews, 
issues. Program participants describe feeling more motivated and empowered than ever to pursue their goals. They explain how the cash assistance provided enough of a safety net for them to leave low-paying survival jobs and invest more time into education and skills development that supported their long-term career goals. So this also illustrates how qualitative research can help justify and inform longitudinal data collection. Listening to people's experiences can help us shift our gaze from short-term results as endpoints to how programs help people get on long-term pathways to thriving. Good point. But let's back up, Ruthin, just a little bit. Could you speak to how Colab also makes strategic investments in mixed methods research, sometimes before we make impact evaluation investments? Definitely. This type of upfront research is sometimes called market research, needs assessment, or formative evaluation, because it helps us form and inform solutions before we evaluate them. It involves collaboration among researchers, community members, and people with lived expertise to strengthen programs and inform evaluation priorities. You see, as researchers and social scientists, we're trained early in our education and careers on the importance of minimizing and disclosing bias. That is, the results of our research should reflect the truth as much as possible, without distortion or prejudice. But often the biggest source of bias in research relates to the questions we choose to ask and the types of solutions we focus on in the first place. That's why Colab's approach to funding research for impact starts and ends with listening to the people and communities most affected by the problems we're trying to solve. That's right, Matt. And to those tuning in, a key takeaway from this nerdy conversation is that we can't end poverty in the dark. We hope you'll find ways to help us build and use actionable evidence as a guide and light for population level impact. I'm Andrew Dayton with the Constellation Fund, and today I get the opportunity to have a conversation with Dr. Brittany Lewis. Dr. Lewis is the founder and CEO at Research in Action, a truly groundbreaking social benefit corporation established in 2018 to reclaim the power of research by centering community expertise. She's also a former university professor, Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank scholar in residence with 15 years of experience designing and leading impactful research in collaboration with affected communities. Dr. Lewis, on behalf of our whole team, we're just really grateful for your time today and for your partnership in this work. And personally, I'll just add that I'm an admirer of your work and of research and action. You're really working to shift paradigms in sectors, including philanthropy, which is something that Constellation is endeavoring to do. So it's exciting for me to have the chance to ask you a few questions today. Thank you for having me. Okay, so you're a researcher. Um, you have spent time in academia. And now, through your work at Research in Action, you are bringing a new approach to research through your work across Minnesota from topics ranging from evictions to public safety and beyond. Can you talk a little bit about some of the key principles and practices that you bring to your work and that you might see an opportunity for Colab to bring to its work? A hundred percent. At Research in Action, we have something called the Equity in Action model. And in our model, it's guided by three core values. Um, One of those core values is actionable research, meaning that you have to co-design research from the very beginning with the intention of it being actionable um, to have the outcomes that you're seeking. And often that means how you build build the table from the very beginning, which stakeholders or partners are influencing the process and also supporting the goals of the project. Um, We also value the community-led process. So in short, from the beginning to the end of our process, we engage most impacted community members to co-design, whether it's the survey tool or the engagement strategy with us, um, so that we are constantly both raising up community leadership, but also defining the research question and goals in partnership with those community members. And in that way, we're also ensuring collective buy-in as they kind of travel with us throughout the process. And the last value of ours, we talk really explicitly about racial justice. And we say that because we want to move a bit beyond acknowledgement and more toward co-collaboratively developing reparative solutions with people. Um, And we want that to be a genuine and active pursuit. Awesome. Thank you. And 
you've been generous to share many of those principles in conversation and collaboration with the CoLab team as they work to bring this new initiative to life. I'd be curious to hear what you see as CoLab's opportunity to truly add value in community in Minnesota. 100%. Um, I'm excited you asked me that question. Um, when I think about the footprint that philanthropy leaves behind, um, I think there are very few philanthropic organizations that are leaning into co-designing with the folks that they claim they want to serve. And I see CoLab actively leaning in and through our partnership, having the ability to model for other philanthropic organizations what it looks like to co-design a strategy with impacted community members in this context of living in poverty, to actually make investments in partnership with those folks, um, illustrate the outcomes of your research um, that were co-designed with those folks that help guide some of your investments. And I see CoLab actively leaning into that. Um, in many ways, something that other philanthropic organizations um, are perhaps, hmm, I would say, timidly cautious about doing. Um, but I think it illustrates more of your values as an organization and your willingness to partner. Um, and I think it'll be an amazing model for the philanthropic community to do that. Thank you. Well, so as you know, longitudinal research is going to be a core focus for, for CoLab. But as it turns out, the first research grant from CoLab is not for a longitudinal impact evaluation. It's for what we, sing, what we see as a groundbreaking study called Pass the Mic that you and your team are leading. And I'd love it if you would take a moment to introduce that project. What are the goals? How are you thinking about implementing it? We're, we're honored to be in partnership with CoLab to both co-design and execute the Pass the Mic um, project. What's really awesome about the ethics of this project is in its name. We wanna pass the mic to folks living in poverty to tell us what they need to thrive. Um, and CoLab as an organization is seeking that clarity and partnership with folks living in poverty to ensure that what we learn in that process can help influence their investment agenda. Um, this for me is what innovatively um, other philanthropic organizations, in my opinion, should be watching. Um, the goal here is to ensure that perhaps we can help inform future investment decisions that you all make, but that community understand how they are part of that process. And then you have opportunity also to go back to community and say, here's what I heard you say, right? And here's within our capacity to invest and in support. Um, and I think that also helps CoLab and the Constellation Fund, more broadly speaking, think about what longitudinal study investments it will make mm -hmm. um, as it invests in what those who say um, this is what they need to thrive, um, say they need. Um, so in many ways, we're excited about the partnership. We're excited about perhaps many more past the mic surveys over time. Um, for us to kind of ground truth what changes over time as we um, move this from perhaps the focus on three counties or cities to a statewide engagement. Um, and I think it could be a really good opportunity for CoLab to also continue to assess and reevaluate itself yeah. through what they're learning from community. Yeah. Well, Dr. Lewis, thank you for taking the time today for your partnership in this work and for all you do for this community and beyond. As I said earlier, we're all big admirers of your work and it's really an honor for us to be able to work alongside you on this project that like you, I hope uh, turns into something much bigger as we move forward, so thank you. Um, and now it's my turn to pass the mic over to Matt again, who is gonna be joining, uh, joined with a couple of special guests to focus on a pretty cool example of what a longitudinal uh, impact evaluation can look like and has looked like, and this is an example that Matt is very familiar with, having led this study in his previous work. It's also an example of a potentially groundbreaking research initiative that began by partnering with and listening to people experiencing poverty, in this case, young people experiencing homelessness in New York City. So Matt, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Andrew, and thank you so much, Dr. Lewis, for your partnership and for your critical perspective. 
Colab is new, so we don't yet have funded evaluation examples that can give a good picture of exactly the kinds of actionable research that we aim to catalyze. We're just starting to make our first investments and we'll have some exciting work to share with you over the coming year. In the meantime, I'd like to illustrate what we're talking about with an example I've had the privilege of playing a role in. It's a project called Trust Youth. And I've, had, I've invited a couple of leaders to help me explain how this work shows how rigorous, actionable research can look. The Trust Youth Initiative involves the first study of the effectiveness of direct cash assistance with youth-driven supportive services to help advance the goal of ending youth homelessness. It started in New York City, and now there are similar pilot programs and evaluations emerging in multiple other locations across the country, including here in Minnesota. I have with me today Matt Klein, Chief Impact Program Officer at Robin Hood Foundation, and I also have Quincy Powell in Minnesota, the Opportunity Youth Network Manager at Youth Prize. Both have been key collaborators on this body of research. But before I turn it over to them, I want to share how this project came about. At Colab, you see, we aim to find and prioritize the kinds of programmatic solutions that Colab funded research will evaluate by listening to people closest to the problems we're trying to solve, and then deeply analyzing what has the potential for real impact on people's lives. Trust Youth gives one good example of that. The Trust Youth Initiative started not with pre-existing idea of what the solution should be, but with a deeper assessment of the problem and with collaboration with young people with lived expertise of homelessness. At the time, I was research fellow at Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago, conducting research with colleagues on youth homelessness across the country. So New York City's mayor's office engaged my team to lead the city's first ever comprehensive youth homelessness system assessment. In doing so, we partnered with multiple city agencies, with nonprofits, directly with local youth leaders with lived experience, and young people co-led the research as well as the interpretation of the implications from the assessment. The assessment produced several recommendations, but one of them was the concept of direct cash transfers with youth-driven services. The city spends a lot of taxpayer money on shelters that are not often good environments for young people and on housing programs that often aren't meeting youth-specific needs. Given the gap of flexible youth-driven resources to quickly find housing that aligned with their preferences and the services that they said that they needed, the young people recommended creating and testing a new cash transfer program. We decided to call it Trust Youth because it emphasized the importance of placing trust and opportunity in young people's hands. We took this recommendation and we raised initial funding from the Robin Hood Foundation to work with young people directly and with city government partners to co-design the program as well as a rigorous evaluation. So now I'm pleased to turn it over to Matt Klein to share from his vantage point how this type of research can influence systems change and lend to population level impact. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to share a screen with you again. When we met, you served as executive director of New York City's Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. Tell me, why did your office, representing a major city government, choose to collaborate on this kind of research? Thanks, Matt, and good to see you too. Um, yeah, at the time, I was running the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity, and that office is charged by the City of New York uh, to help it use evidence to address poverty more effectively. So basically to identify what works so that the city can do more of that and less of what doesn't. And we knew we weren't getting the best outcomes we could for young people, uh, you pointed out. Um, and at the time, you know, we there were about 4,500 young people in New York City experiencing homelessness. Homelessness overall runs into the billions of dollars uh, of, uh, of the city of New York spending. Um, and while we're committed and know we need crisis services, we also wanted to find more effective pathways for young people from crisis service into permanent housing. And um, we also knew from experience that in order to make change at the system level, um, rigorous evaluations can be critical um, when we have reliable data uh, that 
is clear about what's working and what isn't, um, we can use that uh, to influence the way that the city works. And so uh, without the rigorous evaluation that you brought um, to the to the project, we wouldn't have been interested in a small pilot. Uh, it was really the component that um, you brought, which would marry uh, both the insights of the young people, but also the rigor and discipline of, of research methodologies that would provide the kind of evidence that we knew we would need if, if this program was going to operate at scale. Um, and I've seen as something, you know, both in government and out that um, that level of rigorous research really advances um, systems change. We've seen it in different areas, whether it's college completion, early childhood, educational practices, that when there is those that level of rigorous research, um, the influence on change is enormous. That's very helpful background. Still, there are a lot of studies that you could have invested in. Why did you partner on this one? So I, I think there were two factors that made this uh, particularly attractive. One was just the origins of the study and, and the design. Um, the fact that it came from young people who were experiencing homelessness themselves. Um, you described that uh, we engaged with, with you and others to do uh, system assessment. Um, but as a critical and, and somewhat unusual piece of that system assessment, um, you engage deeply with young people who were themselves experiencing the system. And so uh, their advocacy for this kind of intervention uh, was something that, that carried a lot of weight with us. Um, but secondly is sort of the approach that you took uh, toward collaboration. You know, too often, I think we see that pilots are, you know, the, the notion is do a small pilot if it works, you know, all the other relevant stakeholders will get on board, you know, funders will flood in and government will adopt. And I rarely see uh, that trajectory. Um, what's critical is that the decision makers um, are engaged from the beginning. And so what you did is really involve different parts of uh, the public sector, different departments in New York City uh, to be engaged in the development and design. Um, I remember our meetings where uh, the Zoom screen was filled with boxes of people from different agencies providing input that then you adopted in, this, in the development of the design so that it took on a, 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 a design that if it worked could be replicated and, and used in government at scale. And that made a difference. It meant that there was more support. Um, the city issued a press release along with you all about this level of work. Um, we advocated with you um, to ensure that young people's uh, income from this project wouldn't um, disqualify them from benefits for which they were eligible. And so the approach, the, the origins, and then the collaboration really made this, uh, this study stand out from others. It's fun to recall how all of this came together with the Trust Youth Study in New York City. How do you think this example relates to CoLab as a new philanthropic venture? Well, I'm really excited about CoLab. I'm thrilled to, uh, to and looking forward to seeing what comes out of it. I think what is unique is setting out at the outset to focus on population level impact. Um, so very often uh, we see philanthropy and research focus on uh, very small scale uh, interventions without uh, aspiration and clear intention from the very beginning uh, to affect systems change. And I think that, and that is because it's difficult, uh, as we described, to wrangle the various stakeholders to engage folks uh, from, from the beginning, to work with folks who have lived experience and policymakers and funders um, and nonprofit providers and to have them part of a collaboration. But I think uh, if CoLab pursues the kind of approach that it took with the Trust Youth Initiative in New York City, then I'm very excited for the possibilities of seeing research emerge that um, marries the lived experience um, insights uh, with the rigorous methodology methodologies of research that that truly will have the potential to influence systems change. So I think um, I'm excited to see what you do. 
And funny you should mention that, Matt. Quincy's led at the forefront of bringing trust youth to Minnesota and ensuring that young people have shaped this longitudinal impact evaluation locally. Quincy, hi. Tell us how this came about. It's good to see you, Matt. Thanks for, uh, thanks for asking. So I'll share a little bit about how this came to Minnesota and how we're paving our own path to population impact. As you've heard with the case in New York, it started with giving young people the chance to define the solution that works best for them. Often, we're left with programs that are decided by funders, policymakers, and nonprofit leaders that are best for us. But if we are trusted as young people, we have a lot of expertise about our lives and we um, can bring our own experiences to the table. So when the solutions are truly youth-led, they look and they feel very different. I think about the Youth Action Board in Hennepin County and how they thought about cash transfers as their top priority as a solution for addressing youth homelessness in Minnesota, as well as our partners in the community. So young people have recognized this type of program could provide flexibility to find the best housing solution for them quickly. Also, we felt that access to this kind of resource could help address a critical imbalance. Structurally, what we've done is created a society where young people need financial support, whether it's from family or government assistance, just to launch into adulthood. So I remember Matt sharing a report about Merrill Lynch that talked about nationally, young people receive in total about $500 billion in support from their families. So if we don't talk about what we're creating structurally and how we're making it impossible for young people to launch into adulthood, we're not being honest. Out of youth who experience homelessness in Minnesota, Black people make up 5% of the population, yet 39% of the population who experience homelessness. So we don't have access to the same resources just for survival, let alone to thrive. We also don't have access to afford housing. We don't have a safety net and we don't have a platform to go after our goals or aspirations, which results in a widening economic, social and educational disparities between people who look like me and people who don't look like me in the state of Minnesota. So what we believe is that direct cash transfers can help us counter that cycle and give us a shot at stable housing and going after our own aspirations. Also, we knew that this needed a look to build a local evidence base on this type of solution. Can't just assume that it would achieve the results that we wanted. So we need to show it with good data so that we can bring this approach to scale in the state of Minnesota. So we want this research to tell us whether certain aspects of this program design or the cash side or the supportive services could be improved to work better for young people in our state. Myself and a group of young leaders led a movement to bring this kind of pilot and rigorous research to Minnesota. Wow, that's awesome. So this wasn't the top-down initiative of some foundations or academics. This really came to Minnesota because young people made it so. So what came out of this mobilization? <laughs> well, Matt, <laughs> went up against many obstacles and took a lot of work, but Certainly proud to share that we got the state legislature to allocate $5.3 million to the One Minnesota Trust Youth Demonstration, which is a Cash Pilot Plus program for youth experiencing homelessness in the Twin Cities and also in St. Louis County. I also do want to mention that out of the 140 plus direct cash transfer pilots happening nationally, Minnesota is the only state that is including urban and rural communities. So we're thinking small towns, very rural and uh, the urban city, if you will. And so the legislature agreed to do this on, on the condition that we work with researchers and incorporate a rigorous impact evaluation so that our state has the data it needs to influence policy and also system change at the end of this pilot. And currently we're still looking for that research funding. Right now, the process that we're going through is collaborating with young people, collaborating with researchers, on adapting the program model for our needs and preparing the most significant evaluation in any youth homelessness program in our state's history. So if we succeed in accessing longitudinal data, we'll not only be able to test the effectiveness of the One Minnesota Trust Youth Pilot on young people's short-term housing and well-being, but we'll also be able to show how it influences young people's long-term pathways into economic mobility. 
That's impressive, Quincy. And you and your peers should be very proud. Why do you think this matters? What can Colab's approach to research investment take from this example? Well, before my involvement in this work and before this impact forum, many might not have thought that a bunch of young people would be excited about longitudinal impact and qualitative evaluations, but we're ready. We're ready for the research's big results and we're ready for the changes. And what's most exciting about it for me is my, my involvement, the youth researchers' involvement and the youth in the communities who will be impacted shared ownership in this movement. I'm really excited about the work that CoLab is going to be doing. And I think that CoLab funded evaluations will have the greatest impact if they involve meaningful collaboration with people with lived expertise and they focus on the solutions that communities say that they need. Matt and Quincy, thank you for providing two unique and important vantage points on this example of impact evaluation of an innovative solution to youth homelessness. You've helped us to connect the dots between collaboration with people with lived experience, longitudinal impact evaluation, and paving pathways to systems change that can ultimately lend to population level impact. In doing so, you've given us a glimpse into the kind of game-changing collaborative research that CoLab aims to fund and support in areas ranging from early childhood to education to economic empowerment. Thank you for your leadership. Good afternoon. I'm Sani Hernandez, the Chief Operating Officer here at the Constellation Fund. And while I know many of you, I'm relatively new to Constellation's universe, but I'm not new to this work. I've spent the last 20 years deeply involved in many of Minnesota's most groundbreaking, intersectional, philanthropic, nonprofit, and community initiatives. And one thing I've learned is that there's no right answer to the most vexing challenges we're facing as a community. Instead, we have to look for and invest in multiple solutions that are relevant and proven to work. And we have to think about how these solutions work both today and how they can change the future. Thank you so much to the panelists and speakers at today's Impact Forum. Your expertise has deepened our understanding of how research can forge new possibilities. With the combined power of longitudinal impact evaluation and community insights, we know that research can innovate and illuminate paths for achieving population level impact. When the Constellation Fund joined the philanthropic marketplace just about five years ago, it brought a new idea to the table. Use the best available research and evidence to better understand and measure which programs have the greatest direct impact for our neighbors experiencing poverty. In partnership with each of you, we've successfully laid the foundation for a strategic and powerful approach to poverty fighting philanthropy. What does this look like on the ground? Well, every day our dedicated grantee partners are working side by side with families and individuals, working with early learners and first generation college students getting ready for their academic journeys, supporting job seekers with new skills to achieve success, and providing emergency housing or mental health services so that families are safe and healthy. These programs are not just initiatives with a heart. They're also proven with a tangible return on investment. On average, $6 for every dollar invested in our portfolio. That's a huge win, right? A huge win for our community and a huge win for people experiencing poverty in the Twin Cities. So fast forward to today. We are thrilled to introduce CoLab as a new tool, expanding the philanthropic table once again. And I'm excited because it signifies a pivotal moment where our community becomes an active participant in the creation of the best evidence about what works and about what has the potential to work even better to move people to thriving. This is a collective effort that ensures our investments are channeled into the most effective solutions. When brought to scale, these can lead population level change. Thank you for joining us today. Together we're fighting poverty and most importantly, we're building a future where thriving isn't a privilege, but it's a shared reality for all. Thank you for being champions and partners in this work. Have a great afternoon.